for the bit of a delay. Um, so when we selected the theme of financialization of health um, for the Michael Davis lecture series, uh, one of the major goals Professor Grogan and I had was not only to introduce the study of financialization, but uh, to a wide variety of scholars and practitioners, but also help uh, people think about how financialization applies to the health system. And Professor William Lazonic has uh, probably been one of the most prolific scholars in doing exactly that. Uh, Professor Lazonic is Emeritus of Economics at University of Massachusetts and is also the co-founder and president of the Academic Industry Research Network, a nonprofit research organization that's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His work has been fundamental to financialization studies, capitalism studies scholarship, and the role of the corporation in the economy, society, and ultimately health. Among his many books, he wrote the 2009 book, Sustainable Prosperity in the New Economy, Business Organization, and High-Tech Employment in the United States, which won the 2010 Schumpeter Prize, as well as his gripping book, Predatory Value Extraction, How the Looting of the Business Corporation Became the U.S. Norm, and How Sustainable Prosperity Can Be Restored. And of course, his most recent book that some of you may have or currently are reading, Investing in Innovation, Confronting Predatory Value Extraction in the U.S. Corporation. Among his many accomplishments is his influential research on stock buybacks. Um, a recent New Yorker article um, described him as the economist who put stock buybacks in Washington's crosshairs. He also has written heavily on the financialization of the U.S. pharmaceutical industry, as well as the impacts of financialization on the COVID-19 crisis and the U.S. policies to combat uh, COVID-19. So I'm delighted to welcome Professor Lazonic as this week's spe uh, speaker for the um, Michael Davis Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, nice to see a good turnout, and uh, I understand there's a good one online, too. Um, okay, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, um, are three things, really, and I'll see what I can get through. Uh, one is uh, the, well, the problem of U.S. health care, that we're not we're, we're delivering uh, uh, low quality, high cost health healthcare in the United States. At least uh, most people experience that. And uh, the question is why? And my answer, or at least the answer that uh, I think is the correct answer, but a lot more research needs to be done, is that uh, basically uh, the economic system is being systematically looted. Public corporations are being systematically looted and now what's called private equity has come and, and joined the looting process. And I've written a lot about the, uh, the public equity part, publicly listed companies being looted, particularly through the, through the means of stock buybacks, but in other, other ways as well. Uh, and uh, I've started in more recently doing work on private equity and particularly focusing on the healthcare system. And what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, uh, first of all, the, uh, the, the nature of the problem uh, that uh, we have uh, US topping the world in uh, uh, health care expenditures per capita. Uh, there's a growing gap uh, between the U.S. and other uh, advanced nations or rich nations uh, in terms of the uh, percent of GDP that's going to health care and it keeps growing. And if, if this uh, statistics actually reflected a great health care system where people were getting the highest quality uh, goods and services from the health care system, uh, then that would be one thing. Uh, but the question is, uh, is that the case? And I don't believe it's the case. Now, the way I get at this is uh, by looking at, okay, well, first of all, uh, and I have some statistics here on uh, exa you know, examples of the U.S. ranking very low in terms of OECD nations, uh, in terms of life expectancy, avoidable mortality, uh, diabetes pre prevalence, and uh, this also in terms of who gets access to health insurance uh, that is very skewed in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, nativity, and citizenship. Um, the uh, uh, Obamacare or Affordable Care Act, uh, before it, Medicare and Medicaid, they've certainly made health care available to more people, uh, but there's a lot of uninsured. Um, and uh, I would argue that the current health system if anything, has not reduced what I'm going to describe as predatory value extraction, people taking money out of the system without putting much in, if any. 
uh, it's actually probably make it, made it worse uh, by entrenching interests who were predatory uh, when uh, basically these deals were negotiated and have become more predatory since then. Okay, I'm, first I'm going to give you uh, an, uh, basically the framework I work with because I come as this not as a healthcare expert uh, or public health expert, I come as, as an economist who's critical of economics and uh, over my career I've developed what I call a theory of innovative enterprise to understand how value is created because you can't extract value that's not created. And in fact, uh, we live in a very rich country and the, the, the pro that's not the problem in and of itself. The problem is that the riches are not going back to, to most of us. Okay, now, uh, if you have an innovative enterprise, uh, and I, I'm not gonna show this graphically or uh, uh, in, in, to any extent today, but I do this in a lot of stuff I, I uh, write and, and teach. Uh, uh, if you actually have an innovative enterprise, you get productivity uh, that's generated uh, within an organization, uh, and let's say it's a business organization that can lead to all these different things. So workers have higher pay, better work conditions, um, including more secure work. Uh, creditors don't need to worry about the company going bankrupt, shareholders high dividends, share prices, t government higher tax revenues, uh, as firm a stronger balance sheet, and consumers get higher quality, lower price products. And higher quality, lower price products is really the manifestation of a successful, innovative enterprise. And so the question that I ask uh, theoretically and then look at it empirically, and I actually have a methodology that I call integrating history and theory or facts and logic, where I try to understand uh, the logic by understanding the reality, uh, is what determines the relation between value creation and value extraction in the economy, or value creation and the distribu distribution of the productivity gains through value extraction. Uh, and I argue that the, the critical determinant of what goes on within major business organizations and setting uh, that, those, that relation. So there's one uh, dimension of this which I've started calling recently progressive value creation, where people who are really involved in working, the government and in, in investing in knowledge and infrastructure, uh, even some people with finance who are really committed to the company and make sure that the finance remains there with the company, uh, they could be involved in something called progressive value creation where not only creating value but there's a kind of fair distribution of the gains among people. Um, and uh, I would argue that this is actually critical to the growth of inno innovative enterprises. This is central for reasons that I'll give you in a minute uh, to innovative enterprise. But then the other side, I have a book by this title, is predatory value extraction, the power of certain parties to appropriate uh, 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 corporate cash, basically take cash out of money, that's, uh, out of the companies that far in excess of their contribution to value creation, which in many cases can be nil. Now, uh, some people would argue that the government is a predatory value extractor. There's all these taxes and they're not giving anything. I, uh, you can have an argument about that. I don't think that's the case. Actually, the U.S. has the most formidable developmental case, uh, state in history. Uh, some people argue that well, workers are getting paid too much, they're extracting too much value without contributing enough. It can happen in certain instances, but I don't think that's the nature of the problem. Uh, I think the research I've done, and I didn't come to this kind of right at the beginning of my career, it took me a long time to get to this, uh, is that through dividends and, and something that I guess I'm best known for, as Joe indicated, uh, stock buybacks, the critique of stock buybacks, uh, shareholders may engage in predatory value extraction. Uh, and so uh, that's what I and a few uh, other uh, uh, people, some of whom I mentioned in this talk, uh, argue. Okay, now to get at this relationship, we have to understand something about uh, the relationship between uh, value creation, value extraction. So and that starts with understanding innovation and the characteristics of the innovation process is uncertain. Uh, you don't know when you invest in, in an innovation if it's going to be successful. If you knew, it wouldn't be innovation. It's collective, there's a learning process that involves lots of people working together, uh, sometimes within a company, but often across uh, whole communities, across the globe, and often uh, also historically in terms of the, and, and that uh, means that it's also a cumulative process. What we can do today is, uh, uh, is what we learned yesterday. And so I stress uh, as essence of understanding any enterprise including uh, a, a nonprofit enterprise in terms of its productivity, is what is the learning process that, that's going on in there and uh, looking at, at how, in fact, you put these collective and cumulative learning processes together in the face of uncertainty. Now that leads, uh, in my kind of theory of innovative enterprise, to having 
three social conditions of innovation, uh, of innovative enterprise that are related to these characteristics of the innovation process. So I talk about strategic control. So I want to know who's controlling companies, what their abilities, incentives. Is these are the people who have the power to allocate resources. Where does that reside and what kind of decisions they make? And this is something that's very researchable. Uh, organizational integration, this is the essence of it. What, uh, who are the people and how are they interacting to get this, keep this, uh, to implement this collective and cumulative learning process? That actually is something you have to get inside an organization to really see what's going on. And the third one is financial commitment, which is about maintaining that cumulative process. So you don't just stop and then start, or start and stop, I should say, and, uh, and no innovation uh, results. You have to sustain that process uh, till you get uh, f financial returns. And uh, it happens that in large corporations that have already uh, been able to get to profitability, the profits that retain, they retain is the financial foundation of, financial, of, of, of their commitment uh, to the enterprise, the reinvested earnings. So as I compare buybacks and dividends to net income. That's not just a metric. It's because net income is that money that you have after you've done all the things you did last year. Uh, that you can now allocate in different ways. And the question is, how is it allocated? Is it for progressive value creation or predatory value extraction? Okay, now when you are successful, you can develop a, a higher quality, lower cost product than previously. This is basically productivity in the economy. Now the problem is, the economic problem, is that the learning process entails high fixed costs. You're spending a lot of money, and that isn't necessarily creating value until it's delivered to people. And if you uh, produce something and there's one unit of it and it costs a uh, billion dollars, well, that's going to be, I guess, a high fixed cost. So you've got to get some economies of scale uh, in these things. And actually getting economies of scale while maintaining quality is actually a very difficult thing to do. But companies are able to do it. And if they can do this, they can generate, in the case of uh, uh, a medicine, uh, one that's the learning process, you it's safer, safer, more effective, and then it makes it more accessible and potentially affordable. Of course, that's if uh, those gains are passed on to the patients. Okay, now in this, uh, uh, I also will make a distinction which is important for talking about the relationship between pu what I call public equity and private equity in goods and services. That actually a lot of this productivity process is a dynamic between goods and services where uh, goods are things that don't require me to have the intervention of the person produce them for me to make use of them, whereas service, I need that intervention. And uh, that nature of services limits the extent to which you can get economy, economies of scale by, by, while maintaining quality. And uh, this is important for healthcare because healthcare is both goods and services. So pharmaceutical uh, that are approved by the FDA, that are sold and prescribed by your drugstore, just become goods. And the, uh, although you need a doctor to prescribe them, but they themselves are goods. And uh, whereas uh, uh, getting the care of the doctor is, is, is services. And uh, although there can be certain scale economies in a hospital or facility that in using those facilities, um, if you try to push it too far, you're going to run up against quality. You see the doctor for a minute, they don't know what's going on, etc. Okay, and now the other thing is that uh, part of our progress, not just in in the healthcare sector and all sectors, is by actually turning uh, services into goods, by codifying, codifying tacit knowledge and actually having platforms that allow us to actually produce higher quality services. And all of us using computers are doing that all the time, or people who actually started their uh, uh, careers and whatever when we didn't have computers know all about this. Uh, is, so we have a dynamic between goods and services that actually uh, is the way we get social project process and where it applies to healthcare is that a lot of things that are services uh, are not things that can be inherently profitable and should not be profitable, but there are people, and particularly private equity, but not exclusively the private equity, that is trying to make them profitable and actually in the process uh, um, often lowering quality. Okay, now, um, so. And, and this gets into stuff so I'll talk about. I'm going to talk more about the public equity side of it, where I've done more research first. But uh, if, if you start trying to get into uh, a lot of the parts, if you can see this, uh, of the healthcare system that our services are not divided that way in this chart. I just threw it up there in terms of how. 
but you can see hospitals are a combination of goods and services in terms of the processes are goods, you get economies of scale out of those, but the, the delivery of the, the, the care is uh, services, et cetera. Um, uh, both of the things are very important to the, the, uh, the system. And in, in, in healthcare and the system as a whole, because goods are the profitable things like producing medicines, producing medical devices, when co those companies that are in that se those sectors, the medical device companies, the, the pharmaceutical companies are making big profits, a lot of those profits need to go to subsidize the services, or they should go if we want to have a, a high quality uh, affordable healthcare system. Okay, now, uh, one of the things that has been enabling, or the thing, I would say, and I saw this happen in the 1950s when I was at Harvard Business School in 1984, no one's talking about maximizing shareholder value. Two years later, everybody talking about it is an ideology that I saw as dangerous at the time, given where I was coming from in economics, critiquing it, because it comes right out of neoclassical economics, which I won't go into to any extent, but just go over to, you know, you have a lot of it here at Chicago. Um, and that. Uh, you have, and, and shareholder value really, in effect, comes out of the University of Chicago, uh, uh, Chicago School at least. Uh, uh, for both public and private equity, it's uh, uh, the notion that companies should be run to maximize shareholder value uh, that legitimizes uh, uh, predatory value extraction. Um, and uh, I critique this by saying, first of all, shareholders uh, don't invest in companies who buy and sell shares. Uh, there's, there's some uh, uh, you know, uh, cautionary note on that, that startups do get money from the stock market. I'll come back to that and talk about that. And a lot of innovation in the healthcare sector, particularly in pharmaceuticals and devices, is coming from startups. But uh, taxpayers uh, actually invest in productive capabilities. Uh, we take a risk of whether there's going to be a return. We have a claim to the profits when they occur. And this, the argument of people like Michael Jensen and others from the Chicago School was that the only ones who take risk are shareholders and they should have the, re the returns if they're, they're there uh, uh, and be because of this risk-bearing role. Workers, every one of us would go work for a company. We take a risk about are we producing something of value to that company? Is it, uh, are we going to get the yields? Well, if we can be fired once we've made that contribution, we're not getting the careers we expected, the returns that we expected. And the irony is that the stock market is really a value extracting institution by and large. Uh, and um, shareholders really are just people like households that buy and sell shares, hold shares for an income, and uh, contribute nothing to, co uh, to companies. I could go into that much more. Now, this is a, a larger framework in which I place this analysis of economic institutions and industrial sectors and business enterprises where these social conditions are at the center. Uh, in this case, the industrial sector is a particular one, which is, uh, uh, let's say, pharmaceuticals, uh, very expensive, very uncertain in terms of the technologies. The markets are often global, big global companies, but also startups, and the competition, because of the startups, is changing often, um, and, and the new drugs coming on the market. But what I want to focus on here is just uh, what I call these institutions, the governance institutions, which relate to strategic control, employment institutions related to organizational integration, and investment institutions related to financial commitment. And just by getting into uh, the case of the pharma, uh, but basically the pharmaceutical industry, uh, by uh, talking about examples of a governance, employment, and uh, investment institution that enable innovation, that don't undermine it, because they can also undermine it. Okay, so this is the Orphan Drug Act, uh, an article by, that owner Tulum and I wrote in uh, 2011, identified these are the, the, the various drugs that are orphan drugs that really kicked off the uh, uh, biotech uh, revolution in terms of successful drugs in the, in the, in the 1990s. Uh, and um, uh, there were enough of them to create a huge speculation in, in biotech stock, which exists today, which I'll come back to a little bit. In terms of uh, enabling employment institution, the National Institutes of Health, uh, with uh, uh, latest budget about 50 billion, uh, 1.6 trillion in 2023 dollars since 1938 when they recorded expenditures, and doubled in real terms between 1998 and 2004. Uh, the Human Genome Project and the threat of bioterrorism were responsible for that. Uh, here, a little more detail: uh, venture capital, where the U.S. has a unique uh, venture capital uh, system. And what I have in here, I don't have time to go through all of it, 
but, but basically there's a whole lot of steps with this, that's starting with the developmental state, uh, the military industrial complex in the 1950s and 60s, venture capital came right out of that. Uh, the Securities and Exchange, Exchange uh, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, 1960, 1963, had a, a special um, uh, study which was to how can you create a market uh, in these stocks that are being spin off from military uh, technology. Uh, that resulted in NASDAQ, uh, which basically originally just was a quotation system, not a trading system, which gave you a, a national stock price or really international stock price for any stock. Intel was uh, listed on NASDAQ after just three years from founding. That could never have happened with the New York Stock Exchange because of listing requirements. Uh, you end up getting rid of fixed commissions, uh, liquidity of the market. Uh, Genentech is founded uh, coming out of uh, 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 basically a micro uh, a technology or a microelectronics VC company, Kiner Perkins. Uh, you have money going into venture capital because of um, uh, the Department of Labor saying that that was all right to do so, and then successful IPOs and reduction in capital gains tax rates. So it took quite a bit to get that venture capital system that is in place uh, there. And people I talked about in other countries, how do you get uh, the U.S. style venture capital system? Well, you, you have to understand the history and you got to put all these building blocks in place, which uh, is, uh, took a long time, it's not that easy. Now this is the book that was mentioned, Predatory Value Extraction, uh, which is uh, basically how this is done in publicly listed companies. And in it, you see chapter three is the stock market is a value extracting institution. And this is what value extraction looks like. So this is the same companies, 216 companies listed for uh, 38 years. Uh, and you can see at the beginning, buybacks are, are virtually nil. Uh, dividends are about 50% of net income. And for the same companies, it's about the same in the last end of it, the last three years, but buybacks are 62% of, of net income. That Rule 10B18, which uh, I call a license to loot, was uh, the Security Exchange Commission in uh, November 1982, basically saying to companies, you can manipulate the market, uh, but we'll give you a safe harbor if you do this uh, within a certain amount. And just for Apple, depending on their trading volume and their stock price on, on a given day, Apple's the biggest looter in history, uh, there they can do $5 billion a day of stock buybacks and not be charged with manipulating the market day after day after day. Okay. Um, I got some uh, kind of visibility for this argument uh, with uh, an article in Harvard Business Review called Profits Without Prosperity. Without prosperity. I have the uh, subtitle there at the top, which I didn't think they would publish, but they did. Stock bar buybacks manipulate the market and leave most Americans worse off. I used to write for radical economics journals. I do still sometimes. I thought that was a more appropriate title for them than for a Harvard Business Review. But not only did uh, they publish it, but I got the article for best uh, 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 outstanding article of the year. So it, it got a fair amount of uh, readership. Uh, with Owner Tulum, who works with me at AirNet, um, uh, we put together the data. We do this really on a yearly basis on going back, as I say, a decade, uh, looking at buybacks by uh, companies in general and uh, pharmaceutical companies. And basically, you can see in that red box that, uh, let's say, uh, the Somire Squibb uh, did over the decade 236% of its net income on. Uh, buybacks and dividends, a little more in dividends and buybacks. For all of the 14 companies at the S&P 500 index, uh, there were 51% of their net income buybacks, 54% uh, dividends. So they actually spend a little less on buybacks relative to uh, the whole data set, uh, 51 to 57% of net income, but uh, spend much more on dividends, but they do a lot of buybacks. And those dividends and buybacks are $773 billion, it says at the top there, uh, which was uh, more than their combined R&D. So if they say that we're going to have problems with R&D if we don't uh, uh, do, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 oh, that, we have, that, 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 that we have to invest in R&D and we need high drug prices and we need a lot of profits to do that, we'll say, what are you doing with the profits? Uh, one of the reasons they do this is because CEOs are incentivized to do this. Uh, they're all also pressured to do this by hedge fund activists, which I'll come back to a little later. Uh, but there's, there's self-interest. And in most of the uh, high pay of CEOs, and here we separate the pharma CEOs of these are the top, or the, the, the highest paid executives, not necessarily CEOs, uh, for each year from to, uh, 2006 to 2022. Uh, the vast majority of the, the, their pay comes from a stock-based pay, stock options and stock awards have realized 
gains from stock options and stock awards. Um, uh, I'll just skip this. This has to do with price gouging, but also with the mismeasurement of executive pay. I can just use it here. Uh, basically, uh, in, in 2022, Kenneth Frazier, the, when he, the year that he was leaving, uh, uh, Merck uh, took home $118 million. That went into his bank account. In, in their uh, proxy statements, recorded that he made $8.5 million. Uh, that had nothing, that's because he didn't get any stock options or stock awards in that year. Uh, and there's a total mismeasurement problem, which you can read about if you're interested in it, because it's all out there in terms of the wrong measure of executive pay. In the case of Ian Reid, the last year he was there, 40, 50 million that he, he took home, uh, and uh, they record 16 million. Uh, this, you probably can't see uh, the, the data anyway, but it's basically the top six uh, uh, highest paid executive, pharmaceutical executives each year uh, from 2006 uh, to 2022. Uh, Stefan Bansell at Moderna, it's, that's, it's $398 million uh, in 2022. That's not including his founder shares that, he's, that he sold because as a founder, this is just his soft based pay. Uh, that was not the highest all time. The highest all time was Leonard Schleifer at Regeneron, which the year before, 550, 453 million. Okay. Um, I'll skip this um, and just uh, say that stock buybacks undermine investment in innovation. Uh, remember, strategic control, organizational integration, financial commitment. If people are running companies, their highest priority of using corporate cash, and this is not small amounts, this is billions of dollars for large companies a year, uh, is to just get their stock price up. Uh, they're not uh, focused on the need to invest in a new round of innovation, and often they don't. Uh, organizational integration. Uh, when it uh, does uh, stock buybacks and under in, the, in organizational learning, a lot of which comes not by formal training, but just by keeping people employed and keeping the labor force there. And, and uh, if you have a high level of mobility of labor and you're not keeping your good workers, then uh, you're going to have a problem with your innovation. And financial commitment, since uh, uh, your profits are the foundation of being able to borrow money and, and expand, uh, if you just give this money away to people who are just selling the shares uh, to make gains, which is what stock buybacks done as open market repurchases do, then you have a big problem. Um, in pharma, uh, the big pharma companies had, uh, and it's in trouble now, it's been in trouble for about a decade actually, uh, the blockbuster model, and you can see this with Merck and Pfizer, basically their buybacks go back to at least uh, the 19, late 1980s, but they, they became, they're, they're uh, can be for uh, d uh, over a decade or more, more than 100% of profits. And basically what they were doing is uh, there was a lot of mergers in the, the pharmaceutical industry and these companies were the remain, remained after the mergers. They were getting lucrative blockbuster drugs with patent life left, uh, milking the, the, the patents on those uh, until the patents expired and using it to prop up their stock prices. And all the while arguing that they need high drug prices to invest in innovation. Now, there was a different uh, era in which uh, pharma existed. And uh, this is a well-known, it's not, usually not quoted in full, but from George Merck in 1950, uh, we try to remember that medicine is for the patient. We ne try to never forget that medicine is for the people, is not for the profits. The profits follow. And if we remember that, they have never failed to appear. That's the profits. The better we have remembered it, the larger they have been. Okay, so I looked at uh, Merck's uh, annual report comparing 1949 and 1950, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, their uh, sales went way up in 1950 relative uh, to 1949, um, and uh, their employment went up about 500 people, 5,500, 600, but I then was able to calculate the average wages per employee. They went, they went from 3,900 to $4,500 uh, per year. Um, per, uh, well, per employee, not per year, necessarily paid to employee, but uh, uh, well, at least this is the way it, it calculated out, so that probably is the actual, uh, approximates the payment. Uh, they were doing a lot of uh, uh, dividends in 1949 when their profits went way up. They didn't raise the dividend much, and so they had a lot of profits to reinvest, and it says at the bottom there that they were reinvesting in plant and equipment, and that they were, at least they claimed that they were trying to sell at lower prices. They hit, hit some supply constraints, uh, but uh, that, that they were trying to do this. Now, the point of this is that, yeah, it's, it's largely true <laughs> that a company like Merck 
uh, from that time, as it became profitable, and it remained profitable until the Vioxx scandal in 2004, uh, was, uh, had the potential to share the gains with its employee to reinvest. But actually, they stopped doing this uh, around the 1990s. The last uh, person who tried to maintain the old model was Roy Vigelos. He left as CEO in 1995, and then Merck became a totally financialized company after that. And here I have a quote from uh, Kenneth Fraser, who I mentioned was a CEO recently retired of, of Merck, who claimed uh, that he had operated Merck in the tradition of George Merck and uh, uh, profits be, uh, people before profits. That does, is not the case if you look at how Merck was operated under Fraser. Nothing to do with how he, he ran Merck. Um, okay, skip some of this. Uh, <laughs> The CEO who became well known at, at Pfizer, um, the other, another one of the big companies that's been a, uh, just a predatory value extractor is Alfred Burla. He was brought in when their patents were expiring. We need to invest in the pipeline. And actually before the pandemic, Pfizer stopped doing buybacks because it realized that it, it could get taken over, it might not survive if it's kept doing them. And he has this rambling statement in, a, in an earnings call where he says that we were uh, engineering, uh, financial energy engineering, purchasing back our salaries like uh, two years ago or a year ago. Now we're a different company. Well, they became a different company because they had to. I uh, just skipped over a previous slide. They still couldn't resist doing $2 billion in buybacks in March of 2022 uh, when their CFO was leaving to give them a little present of a boost in their stock, buy, uh, stock price. Uh, uh, Burla, uh, again, I won't have time to really go through this, but in his, a book that he wrote uh, uh, talking about the uh, development of the really the BioNTech drug, not really the Pfizer drug, but the vaccine, uh, he starts with this notion that they should have priced it at $600. That would be the value to society, and then he gets down to $20, what they actually priced at the price of a simple meal. But basically, it's, it, this is out there all over the place, and it's part of the predatory value extraction that the companies should be charging uh, prices that uh, reflect the savings to society of, of those drugs. That assumes that those companies actually saved all that money. There's all the inherited uh, science uh, that, they, that they're able to use, never mind the people within the companies who are not necessarily sharing this if, in fact, they're using all the profits to just prop up their stock prices. Um, this is uh, an article it appeared recently by, uh, by Lynn Paramore, works for Institute for New Economic Thinking, where my organization, we get quite a bit of <coughs> funding and have quite a <coughs> bit of interaction with them, which was featuring uh, stuff that I was saying and also someone you may know as work, Fred Ledley, who talks about <coughs> government funding of, of innovation and making this argument that in the current context of price negotiations, you don't need high drug prices uh, because they're not going to use it to innovate, they're going to use it to engage in predatory value extraction. And Fred Ledley at, at uh, Bentley College, they've done studies which just show how much uh, money has gone into approved drugs by the NIH, uh, and, uh, and, and it's essentially uh, making the argument that in price drug uh, negotiations, uh, 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 drug price negotiations, that the uh, um, uh, government and Medi Medicare in this case should be recognizing the extent of the government investment already. Um, this I'll just go very, very briefly. It, uh, this is a guy who's a lobbyist uh, for, uh, he used to be